Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. A very warm welcome uh, to you uh, on the occasion of the inaugural um, event for a new program at the IWM. Let me first begin by welcoming Her Excellency Ivana Chervenkova, who is with us here tonight, the Czech ambassador, who has been the guiding spirit behind this new cooperation between the Czech Republic and the IWM. I would also like to especially welcome and thank Ivan Kvatik, who is at the Czech Academy of Sciences and uh, has been a long-term friend of the IWM for his support for the program. And especially warm welcome for Klaus Nellen, whom I saw a minute ago. Uh, he's right at the back, as usual. Um, he doesn't want to be seen, but I am going to name him and thank him because uh, what we are celebrating is the inauguration, if you like, of our uh, joint program with the Czech Republic of a Patochka uh, program. And it's a program which Klaus Nellen has set up here. It's been one of the intellectual institutional pillars of the IWM. And we're very happy that we now have a program flanking our archives uh, along with a fellow program and the conference today uh, which we begin tonight with uh, Jacques Rupnik's talk marks the beginning of um, this uh, program. I uh, want to just say for those of you who maybe will not be able to attend the conference a word and then I'm done and that is the conference is dedicated to the momentous 8, 1918, 38, 48, uh, 68 of course um, in um, Czech history, uh, but of course, as I was just informed, it's also dedicated to years in which no events took place which were momentous in Czech history, and some of them were maybe uh, 58 and 78, but even on that we have a lecture. So I hope uh, to see some of you here. I would like to hand over to my colleague, Ludger Hagedon, who has been looking after the program with us and take this opportunity to announce uh, something which is extremely important to us as an institution. Uh, Ludger is, uh, has been at the Institute for a very long time. He has uh, uh, been working on the Patochka program and the archive since a very long time. Uh, but he's here today in a new function. He is a new permanent fellow at the IWM. And with that, a warm welcome to you in your new function, Ludger. And thank you very much for having organized the conference. <laughs> Her Excellency Ivana Czervenkova, Ambassador of the Czech Republic, uh, Rector of IWM Shalini Randeria, tonight's distinguished guest uh, and speaker, Professor Jack Rupnik. Ladies and gentlemen, um, also from my side, a very um, warm welcome to all of you. From my side as the organizer of this event, of tonight's lecture and of the workshop that is going to take place here at the Institute tomorrow. Before I will say a few words about this event, and I promise it will really be short, uh, so don't be afraid, it will be just a short welcome. I obviously want to react, Shalini, on your very uh, nice uh, and warm words at the beginning and your uh, nice welcome for me, which in fact is not a welcome, but a continuation of a welcome, a very generous and gentle one. Uh, and it was wonderful, uh, Shalini, and I very much thank you for that. And my reply to it is threefold. It is very short, but yet threefold. Um, I take it as a gift, I take it as a challenge, and I'm German, I take it as a duty. <laughs> but I take it as a joyful duty, and I hope it will be a joyful duty for me and for the other people at the Institute. And I'd like to say, let's hope for some years of joyful science at the IWM. Thank you, Shalini. <laughs> so, um, this public lecture and the workshop of, to, of, to, of tomorrow with its broad reflection on topical or iconic events of Czechoslovak history of the 20th century 
is like the ideal opening of our new program at the IWM that Shalini just mentions and that we are carrying out in close collaboration with our Czech partners. Many other events are to follow this one and I will not enlist all of them. It might, might suffice to just mention to you at the moment that we will have uh, another event at the Czech Embassy in the autumn of this year, a public debate at the Czech Embassy in Vienna and a second uh, event also in the autumn of this year, a big public lecture in Prague followed by a, by a public debate the very next day with our partners from Charles University and from the Foreign Ministry in Prague. Also, I would like to say that um, due to the generous uh, support of the Foreign Ministry of the Czech Republic, for many years we are now able to run a program for Czech fellows coming to the Institute. We are very thankful for that and due to your generous support, we will be able to, con to, con to extend and to deepen this pro program over the years to come. So thank you for that. The year 2018 is a year of many anniversaries and a special occasion for historical memory and recollection. Only to think of the 100th anniversary of the Republic as of Austria as well as of many of its neighboring countries. Or a second strong incentive for historical reflection, the 50th anniversary of the events of 1968, which had such a tremendous impact on contemporary societies but which also, and that needs to be said, especially on an evening like tonight, had quite a different taste and quite a different message entailed in East and West. As Milan Kundera once nicely put it, the 1968 protests in Paris were regarded as the enthralling outbreak of, as he says, revolutionary <laughs> lyricism, while Prague Spring, um, simultaneously, yet reversely, signaled the disappointment with, with precisely that kind of enthusiasm, post-revolutionary skepticism instead of revolutionary lyricism. This topic, only this topic of 1968, 1968 East and West, I think would deserve, uh, could, could be a wonderful evening, it could also be a wonderful topic for Jack Rudnick, I think, who, has, uh, uh, who, who is so very close to both of that events, 1968 East and West. However, the year 2018 also, and I might say especially so, calls upon us to revisit the iconic moments of Czech and Slovak history, where one cannot but note the outstanding meaning of what we have decided to call the Momentous Eight. The national independence and formation of the Czechoslovak Republic, 1918, the Munich Agreement, 1938, that allowed Nazi Germany the annexation of the so-called Sudetenland and sub subsequently the occupation of the whole country, the seizing of complete power by the Communist Party in 1948, the worldwide observed crushing of Prague Spring in 1968, and finally the Velvet Revolution of 1988 and a bit of 89 as well, it, <laughs> indeed. All of them major events, good or bad, beneficial or disastrous, celebrated or cautiously hidden. In any case, there is a pattern of events in Czech or Czechoslovak history, as one should say, that involves the momentous eight. <coughs> as should be clearly noted, all of these historical dates not ca only carry an almost emblematic significance in the national context, but they also indicate decisive turning points for European history. Obviously so, for example, in the events of 1938, foreshadowing the European catastrophe to come, or with the iconic Prague Spring, where the name of the city stands for all the hopes attached to the reforms and for all the icy years of restoration to follow. I am very happy that Professor Rupnik, for his keynote of tonight, will also stress this European dimension of the momentous aid in Czech history. The speaker himself, Jack Rupnik, will now be introduced by my colleague Ivan Vejvoda, a permanent fellow at the IWM, who will also moderate the talk and the ensuing discussion. After the debate, you're all invited for a glass of wine downstairs in our cafeteria. And I wish you both now an instructive and an exciting evening with a momentous aid. 
and certainly, and this is my last word, certainly it is not by accident that we are celebrating the momentous eight today, on the evening of the eighth. Thank you. Have a nice evening. Uh, Ludger, thank you very much. Madam Ambassador, dear friends and colleagues, uh, it's a really uh, not a cliche to say that it's an honor and pleasure to introduce Professor Jacques Rupnik. But let me start with this last date and congratulate International Women's Day uh, to all the ladies uh, in the room. I don't have a red carnation, but uh, we might do something about that. Um, Congratulations, Ludger, on the permanent fellowship. I think it great, gives great pleasure to all of us here at the Institute that you have joined the ranks uh, of, of the permanent fellows. Um, Jacques Rupnik, as the saying goes, needs no introduction, but let me say uh, a few words for those of you uh, of a younger generation who, who do not know him. Jacques is director of research at the uh, Centre d'études et de recherche internationale, uh, CRI, a think tank uh, attached to the Institut d'études politiques, Sciences Po, as is colloquially known. Uh, he teaches at the College of Europe uh, in Bruges. Uh, he was notable for being uh, President Václav Havel's uh, advisor in the very early days of the transition. 1990 to 92, but stayed in, in close uh, contact uh, with him and is on the board of the Havel Presidential Library in Prague. He teaches regularly, not only in Europe, but also in the United States, where he spends a good time uh, of, of the year. And also he was an advisor to the European Commission. Let me add on a, on a personal note that uh, I, I guess one of the reasons for being uh, asked to introduce uh, Jacques uh, is several fold. Not only because uh, my surname is Czech and I have a Czech uh, background, uh, but more importantly because uh, we are of the uh, somewhat maligned generation uh, that came politically of age in 1968. Uh, we go way too long back in the past. We, in fact, studied together in Paris uh, in those years. And uh, I think uh, our, our, our paths and careers and biographies have been much, in fact, influenced by these dates and events that, that Ludger and Shalini have already mentioned, the, the events of 68 in Paris, and of course, the invasion of Czechoslovakia by the Soviet Union, the Warsaw Pact in 1968. So without further ado, Jacques, please take the floor and then we'll do a Q&A afterwards. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Uh, Shalini, uh, Ludger, Ivan, thank you for your very kind introduction. Yes, indeed, we go back half a century, but you know, what is half a century in a man's life? I mean, uh, <laughs> in a historical perspective. You know. um, I'm glad also that Klaus Nellen is here because the first time I set foot in uh, EVM, it was a very small operation, much smaller than today. It was essentially a trio. Uh, Klaus was a key element in that trio and uh, well you know very well how much this institution owes him and 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 above all the journal that that was associated with it 50 issues great to see um, anniversaries as uh, uh, you well know are more revealing about those who commemorate than about necessarily the events themselves. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, today it's very difficult in Prague not to meet a historian colleague who is not just taken part or about to take part in one of the events. I think the, the Minister of Culture called 143 events uh, associated with the uh, various uh, uh, commemorations. Um, 
You, of course, cannot uh, listen to political debates, especially in a recent electoral con context or post-electoral context as well, actually, without somebody saying that there is a big danger of another February 48 uh, around the corner. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, you have also the jokey version of, uh, of, of all that, uh, when after uh, uh, New Year spent in Prague, uh, uh, on my, my taxi driver on the way to the airport says, you know, fasten your seatbelt, this is your beginning with an eight. Připoutejte se, to je osmičkový rok. Tak, so this, this was, uh, 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 this is how this interest, this uh, engagement with the, uh, the anniversaries uh, is of course associated with certain um, anxieties about the past. And the number eight lends itself very well to that because if you put it, I don't have PowerPoint, I, don't, I never use PowerPoint, but you can just imagine number eight, you put it this way and you have the sign of the infinite. And uh, uh, it also refers uh, to the so-called Möbius strip. The Möbius strip is a surface with only one side and only one edge. It can be made using a strip of paper by gluing the two sides together with a half twist. The twisting is possible in the two direction, so there are different mirror image Möbius strips. A bug crawling along the center of the loop would go around twice before coming back to the starting point. Jacques Lacan if a reference can be made to him, a stone throw from Berggasse, uh, uh, wrote insightfully on this. And the gist of what he had to say, the book is thick like that, but the gist is that basically is that the double loop, the Mobius strip, if you want, uh, the eight, uh, brings you back to the starting point and that is important for the understanding the anxiety of repetition. In of psychoanalysis, I will not uh, uh, go further into this. But clearly, the anxiety about the past is also an anxiety about the future. It points to the idea of cycles and to the eternal return. And in the Czechoslovak narrative, it points to moments of elevation and euphoria, such as 1918, during the spring of 68 or during the Velvet Revolution 20 years later, uh, followed by tragic setbacks, self-defeats and a uh, 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 crushing of the hopes. The Czechoslovak double loop has a great starting point and a great arrival point. In the middle, uh, you have a number of mishaps, to put it. Uh, mildly. Uh, two caveats before I go any further. Um, one is that, of course, this is a Czechoslovak uh, trajectory, and therefore uh, the uh, view of the different aids, their meaning, their perception, uh, uh, is of course very different if you are in Prague or in, or in, or in uh, Bratislava. This is a story of a country that became two. Uh, and I will not attend in, in my talk to fit the Czechoslovak uh, AIDS uh, into something which is now uh, quite uh, uh, fashionable, I was going to say. It's an important trend in historiography, and that is global history. Uh, uh, there is a, a, a recent book has just been published in France uh, um, by a collective volume by Patrick Boucheron uh, entitled Histoire mondiale de la France. And it created quite a stir because, of course, uh, it was breaking the traditional narratives. It was trying to fit uh, 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 the French uh, uh, predicament into, um, into a broader global uh, perspective. I will not go into that direction either. I 
uh, 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 I must point out. I will try to do something in between uh, um, and hopefully of some relevance to the colloquium and that is the connection between the Czechoslovak AIDS and the European uh, uh, predicament. Uh, I take the Czechoslovak AIDS as a kind of barometer, a seismograph, uh, un révélateur, you would say in French, uh, of the predicament uh, uh, of uh, 20th century uh, Europe, the crucial junctures of the 20th century. They are Czechoslovak, but they are uh, European. I confine myself to the 20th century. I could, of course, have taken other aids uh, in which fit into that line of thinking. 1848, Printemps des Nations, Printemps des Peuples. This is a spring of nations. This is, this, this is uh, uh, where, for the first time, you know, Czech nation moves from culture to politics. And, and, and uh, the in basic ingredients of what we're going to be talking about later are already there. I could have also uh, taken uh, 1618, the beginning of the Third Year War, uh, which also, which was also a truly European war, if I dare say so. <laughs> and, and it starts in Bohemia, and it starts in Prague, with the Prague defenestration. So anyway, um, this is just to uh, tell you that the aids of the 20th century are sufficient for us this evening. And uh, uh, I must uh, move on, because really what, why the Czechoslovak aids are interesting, because at each juncture in that loop, that double loop, this Mobius strip that uh, Lacan talks about, uh, you have there the key dilemmas of 20th century Europe between East and West, between capitalism and socialism, between democracy and totalitarianism. And therefore, at each time, I will try to uh, make the connection uh, imperfectly, of course, and, uh, and in the discussion, and of course tomorrow during the colloquium, we will have more time uh, to, uh, to explore that. Uh, uh, I will simply say that perhaps just to, 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 uh, to show the context in which we are talking about this, there is a publication produced by the Academy of Science, a group collective effort, called Cesco Natsestje, which has a sponsorship, and there was a colloquium in Prague, the foreign minister was there, the head of academy, etc. And it is interesting, it is called Cesco Natsestje, Czech on the road, but of course the question is on the road to what? <laughs> that is, of course, uh, 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 the unanswered uh, question. And uh, uh, again, the same question about where at each juncture you're heading, um, uh, I'm, as a 68er, I'm reminder of, reminded of, uh, of somebody I, 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 I had a lot of time for because he was sort of the enfant terrible of the, of the uh, Czech intellectual scene uh, at the time, uh, the philosopher Ivan Svitak. And there was a, there was a uh, um, survey in the student paper uh, called Student uh, in April, and they asked everybody, you know, uh, where from? Where to, with whom? This was a question. And they, they had a long list of people they asked. And, and, and Svita gave the shortest answer. From Asia to Europe alone. <laughs> that was, that was, <laughs> that was, uh, uh, so, um, okay. From Asia to Europe alone or together. Let's start in 1918, the birth of Czechoslovakia. Uh, is the illustration par excellence of the interplay uh, uh, between the national and the European. And in the Whig history of the Czechs, you know, the dominant narrative, this is the fulfillment of the national uh, aspirations of Narod Nyobrozeny, the national revival of the 19th century, etc., etc. But of course, it becomes part of the remapping of Europe in, 19, uh, in 1918. Uh, that remapping uh, is crucially uh, important because the founder of the state took a major part in actually formulating the remapping. 
He was in London during, uh, during uh, the war. He gave a first lecture at King's College in 1915, Thomas Masaryk uh, uh, I'm talking about. And the following year, he started a publication called The New Europe. The New Europe. And of course, he's thinking about the new, etc. but the new Europe. And what you have there is an argument he's trying to formulate for the allies, for the Western democracies, their war aims. They didn't have, they didn't have a clue. They, 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 you know, there was Austria, there was these empires. They didn't understand very much these regions. And here is somebody who actually says, well, let me give you an alternative vision. What we have here is the threat of German Middle Europa. And German Middle Europa, that is an expansionist, imperialist, authoritarian project, uh, which not only includes Austria, uh, 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 which has uh, uh, fallen prey to that, but you know, the, he says there is, he speaks of an, uh, and, and his book then, uh, because that, his essays become a book then in 1918, the year we're talking about, he, he talks about an axis Berlin to Baghdad, interestingly. Well, that's Mittel Europa stretched a bit far. Uh, I'm sure Mr. Rumsfeld would have liked that, but uh, uh, um, no, the, the, so, and of course, to, as an alternative vision to, to the German concept of Mittel Europa, which includes the Balkans and all that, uh, he formulates the project of sovereign nations, democratic nations associated with the West, and he uh, provides lengthy arguments that I do not have time to uh, uh, go into now. Um, but what, uh, so that is one thing. He provides the alternative vision of the new Europe at that time when it's most needed, 1916, 1917, all the way to 1918. And secondly, he provides an interpretation of what uh, the founding of the new states in 1918 means. And it's interesting just, uh, uh, it actually uh, dispenses me with, with a long argument. The, the, uh, the, the, Czech, uh, the Czech title is Svetová revoluce, World Revolution. The English title is more modestly called The Making of a State. <laughs> and you, ha you, have, you have there the two things. That is for Masaryk, the justification for creating a state is only and only under these conditions acceptable to him, to the Czechs, but also to Europe as a whole, if it is connected to a European and more broadly universal project. And that project is a democratic project associated with the West, etc., etc. So this, his reading of World War I is a confrontation between authoritarian semi-feudal uh, uh, empires and Western democracies which are to be the future uh, of uh, East Central, Central Europe. So you have there the connection between the national and the, and the universal and of course you have there immediately uh, an echo you know, Wilson, you have the 14 points, self-determination, and then you have the speech about uh, making the world safe for democracy. You have the two things. And uh, so Masaryk fits into that, uh, uh, into that uh, project. And uh, of course, as we have discovered later, combining self-determination of nations and democracy in East Central Europe turned out to be a very tough proposition. Apologize for my voice, which I hope will last till the end of this talk, at least. Um, so Masaryk's view, and this is how Czechoslovakia is, is part of this democratic triumphalism of 1918, which is an echo, of course, of the 1989 <laughs> a, a, a triumphalism uh, of a similar uh, kind. Not everybody bought it at the time, of course, needless to say, and you have a whole range of authors who immediately, I mean, 
I don't have time for that now, but I can only mention two. Uh, Oscar Yassi warned against Kleinstaaterei, unviable uh, uh, small states, etc., um, leading to feuds, etc. What would Hugh Seaton Watson, the son of R. W. Seaton Watson, because when Masaryk was in London during the war, he was with R. W. Seaton Watson, the New Europe that was R. W. Seaton Watson. And then you have the son who became a leading specialist on East Central Europe, and he described Eastern Europe between the war as a private civil war between these new born states. Uh, so that was one warning, 1919, Oscar Yassi. And same year, uh, Jacques Bainville, the French conservative historian, who wrote Les conséquences politiques de la paix, the political consequences of peace, kind of echo to Keynes's economic consequences of peace. And he describes, this is an amazing book, because it describes exactly what was wrong with the, the new order and what was its vulnerabilities and how it's going to end. <laughs> you know, because basically he says Germany remains compact and you have there a series of small vulnerable states. De quoi l'Allemagne est-elle sainte d'un chapelet de Serbie? Et encore. He says, okay, what is Germany being surrounded by? By a strip, uh, back, back to, not Merbius strip, but simply a strip of uh, 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 Serbias. Et encore, okay. So uh, that is, that is uh, uh, the insight that with the loss of the Austrian Empire, you lose the pivot of what was Central, uh, uh, Central Europe. So you have there the two visions, and they are present very, uh, very, uh, very early on. OK, I must uh, maybe uh, skip other considerations about the new European order, simply to address a second issue where Masaryk and the newly founded state is important, is that it embodies the shift in the definition of the nation from an ethnic cultural concept to a political concept. You know, Masaryk says, and he already was, of course, arguing for that at the end of the 19th century, uh, the nation and the people are now understood to be understood politically. Okay? So this is the idea that you have a political, you move from ethnic to political nation. And there comes a snag. You have a new state founded on this idea, and then how do you actually translate it? Well, you discover that there is immediately the birth of another concept, which is a Czechoslovak nation. And that's the Czechoslovak nation, where, of course, you can see the two problems. What about the Germans and the Hungarians? And secondly, Czechoslovak nation, yeah, this was a concept which legitimized the foundation of the state, but uh, um, as we have again discovered later, there were a lot of ambiguities in the understanding of what that means. Incidentally, the Slovaks did accept the term in their declaration uh, uh, from Sveti Martin in, in October 18. They, they use the word Czechoslovak. They say Czechoslovak nation composed of a Czech and Slovak nation. Okay, great. You know, uh, <laughs> see you in a century <laughs> or before, or before as it turned out. So this, is, this was sort of the Czech and you can broadly, more broadly think Central and East European variations on the idea of, on, you know, the European debate between the French and the German, the civic and the ethnic concept of the nation. And uh, um, this, of course, these vulnerabilities, internal vulnerabilities, materials, as you know, during the 1930s, and Munich is the next juncture where this question was uh, uh, particularly address. Uh, and uh, again, to put it in a uh, nutshell, uh, this Munich uh, put an end not just to Czechoslovakia, but to the European order established in, uh, in 1918. And there, the interplay between domestic vulnerabilities and external change in the European order was, uh, 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 was an obvious one. I would simply say for the pur purpose of uh, our discussion that the word Munich, of course, resonates very strongly uh, uh, for the Czechs, but it has become a form, you know, 
throughout Europe a term which represents you know, the weaknesses of liberal democracies in the face of external totalitarian threats of one kind or another. And of course, as always with such uh, terms, they tend to be used and abused. I remember when the Helsinki Agreement was signed, uh, and we know how dissidents made good use of that, a um, number of people wrote articles, books, essays, saying, oh, this is a new Munich. You know, this is dividing Europe, consolidating, this is a new, uh, uh, this is a new Munich. Uh, I remember during the war in Iraq, you know, people saying, you know, that, the, uh, uh, that those who didn't participate uh, and didn't go in the struggle against Saddam Hussein were behaving in the, like Munich, etc. You know, the, the word Munich, as I say, as you know, has been used and abused ever since, uh, uh, which is interesting. And per in East Central Europe, I would say, only the word Yalta has as such a powerful connotation, a symbolic meaning of the abandoning of the nations of East Central Europe by, uh, Western, uh, by Western democracies. Um, uh, Munich starts what I would call the tragic decade. This is not just a one-off event. Of course, this is the end of Czechoslovakia. Slovakia becomes an independent state under the Nazi protection. You, you know all that. Uh, no, it's a, it's a beginning of a, a tragic decade uh, which entails both a foreign policy orientation and a domestic one. And uh, uh, the, this is not just an emotional reaction after the betrayal, uh, but, uh, and you can read about that incidentally, those of you who are interested in, you want an emotional outpour, you read Maisky's diary, the, the, the Soviet ambassador in Moscow, and he describes how Jan Masaryk, the, 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 the Czechoslovak ambassador, the son of the founding father of the president, Jan Masaryk, foreign minister, etc., how he comes to see him the morning after, and cries over his shoulder, they sold us down the drain, you know, they treat us for them, we are like, uh, like Negroes are for Americans, etc. I mean, this is it, you know, the great embrace at that moment, it's crucial. It's, okay, there's the emotional moment, but that's, I'm not talking about that. What Benish is after is, because he, pr he prides himself as being the continuator of Masaryk, one, and second, being the cool, uh, diplomat who knows, you know, who doesn't get, uh, 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 doesn't get precisely, doesn't get emotional like, like, uh, uh, like Jan Masaryk. And he basically starts from Munich. This is where he starts a geopolitical reorientation of the country, uh, of its future existence. And uh, he uh, meets with Stalin, the most important meeting, December 43, where, if you look at all the things on the agenda with Stalin, it all is about undoing Munich. <laughs> How are we going to expel the German? How are we going to punish the Slovaks? How are we going to do with the Hungarians? Etc. You know, it is already, it is all Munich, 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 undoing Munich. And from Moscow, he flies, and the first person he meets, because a meeting with Stalin is, is in December, he flies and meets with de Gaulle. That's the first uh, meeting with de Gaulle, and de Gaulle describes this in his memoirs, uh, uh, his, his meetings. This is very, very interesting, and de Gaulle starts raising objections. You know, what about, what about Stalin, what about Russians, etc. cetera. And uh, um, uh, to this, uh, Benesh replies, regardez la carte, mon général. The Russians arrive in the Carpathians, but the Westerners are not ready to land in France. It will therefore be the Red Army who will liberate my country from the Germans. Therefore, in order to re-establish my administration, it is Stalin I have to find an understanding with. I have just done that under the conditions which do not jeopardize the independence of Czechoslovakia. So there you have it. You know, Benesh's reading of the situation is impeccable. He knows exactly <laughs> the military situation and what will be the consequences. The Poles simply <laughs> couldn't accept that. He accepted it. But then the last sentence, of course, <laughs> this is where 
illusion and delusion you know, meet and, 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 and prepare disaster. Because uh, 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 clearly the idea that Stalin would allow him independence uh, um, was uh, an illusion. And it can all be understood only through this Benesch obsession with undoing Munich. And I had there a long development to show you how this leads to 1948, of course, my own reading is that the real turning point was not 48, but 45, that the key issues, communist control over state, uh, the dominant influence in Czechoslovak politics, etc., uh, was all established already in 1945. Therefore, they could allow a greater degree of flexibility, but still, uh, um, uh, they seize monopoly of power only in 48, and 48 is the symbolic moment where Cold War becomes irreversible. Cold War starts over Poland, <laughs> and Cold War becomes irreversible uh, uh, with uh, the February 48 coup over Czechoslovakia. So the Czechs delayed it, some, some uh, Poles got it before, Bulgarians even before, <laughs> okay, but eventually they all end up <laughs> under the same, <laughs> under the same uh, 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 umbrella. And uh, 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 that brings us, of course, that decayed the slide into, uh, 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 into the Soviet orbit, which is voluntarily accepted. This is a strategy that Benesch drew from Munich. And secondly, he, he also drew during the war the idea that what will come after the war is convergence between East and West, between capitalism and socialism. And in fact, this idea of the third way was quite popular after the war. So I'm talking about Benesch's illusions or delusions, but there were many people, including the Polish Catholic Church, who believed in the third way. I mean, there are many, many variety of very different people who thought, you know, after what we have seen in the 1930s in Europe, with the crisis, with the, uh, the capitalist system clearly not working, and you didn't want the Soviet-style socialism, the third way was that right. So Benesch had this double illusion that he could be a bridge between East and West, and secondly, that there could be this third way, the synthesis between, uh, between uh, 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 or convergence between capitalism and, and socialism. And that made him powerless when the communists moved on. I uh, will not dwell into the 48 communist coup. This is well covered ground. And of course, the main thing about it is what Pavel Tigre described as the elegant takeover. You know, th 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 there is no bloodshed, there is no nothing. It, it all, it is, it presents itself as a, a solution of a government crisis. Some ministers resign, they are replaced by others. And in fact, it is a s solution of a constitutional and of a regime crisis. The interesting thing from uh, a broader reflection is you have no Russian troops on Czechoslovak territory at the time. The Russians had the good idea of withdrawing in December 45. And, uh, uh, and they returned only in August 68. They were not there. And secondly, you have a communist party which got 40% of the Czech vote, 30% in Slovakia. This was huge, 46. There's no equivalent anywhere of a communist party in democratic elections. Uh, and I'm not saying they were fully democratic because they were, uh, uh, the, the, the system prevented one of the pre-war parties, the large agrarian party. from. But still, the only equivalent I can think of is not to be compared with Poland, Hungary, Romania, or what have you, where communist parties were small groups brought to power with the help of uh, external power. Yes, there they are. The story is pretty No, the interesting thing about the Czech situation is that it happens in, a, uh, uh, in modern, democratic, uh, advanced industrial country in the center of Europe, which uh, uh, be partly because of the Munich trauma, but because of a number of other things as well, uh, uh, vote 40% for the communists. And therefore, what I'm interested in, what the Czechoslovak case highlights, is the indigenous base of communist rule. And that 
of course has something to do with the way that society later responded uh, uh, to, uh, to, to the regime or the way it behaved at different other junctures which I cannot now go into. The only comparison would not be with the neighboring Polish, Hungarian or Romanian, what have you. No, would be with France. You have, as in France, uh, um, a communist party which is the, uh, 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 the Czech and the French communist parties were the largest communist parties left in Europe after the defeat of the German party in 1933. And they both operated in a democratic advanced industrial countries and they both were super Stalinist because in a democratic situation you have to constantly purge and become, uh, have a very tough Stalinist posture in order to not to succumb to the social democratic temptation. So uh, uh, the paradox is, of course, is as a communist party operating in a democracy <laughs> becomes more Stalinist than, let's say, the Italian party, which was clandestine and which had somebody like Gramsci who could then develop you know, interesting ideas about cultural hegemony, civil society, and what have you. That is completely away from the political culture of Czechoslovak communism or of French communism for that, for that matter. So uh, uh, that is... Uh, 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 so much for, 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 the, for the 48 and the domestic uh, uh, ingredients of the adaptation, let's say, to, 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 to of society to the regime. 1968, and I have to watch uh, carefully. Now, 1968 is not like you know you would find in Wikipedia or somewhere uh, that it starts on the 5th of January with the election of Alexander Dubček as the head of the Communist Party and it ends on the 21st of August with the half a million Soviet troops marching, uh, marching in. Uh, no, it is a process that goes on throughout the 1960s and therefore 68 can only be understood as a 60s phenomenon. As a, culmination of a decade, and that holds for the whole of Europe, actually. And uh, uh, it, the basic reading provided at the time, Gordon Skilling, the, 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 the historian some of you may be familiar with, uh, had that thesis, that this is, you know, the uh, Czech uh, democratic political culture triumphs over the communist structure from within. It sort of corrupts it from within. They tried something between 45 and 48, it didn't work out. Disappointed with the revolution from above, they tried to bring uh, another one from below, rescue themselves, so to speak, or rescue their youthful ideals, so to speak. And that, uh, that idea that, uh, that the Czech democratic culture prevails over the communist structure, uh, uh, that is something, of course, uh, uh, important for the idea of combining uh, democracy and socialism, which was at the core of the Prague Spring uh, project, and which of course was a great inspiration for the Eurocommunist parties in the West. It was of course <laughs> repoussoir for the East, Eastern Bloc parties, which were asking Brezhnev to step in, you know, Gomulka, Ulbricht and all the others, but in, for the West European Communist parties, the Italians, Spanish, and later even, even the French uh, uh, moved in that uh, uh, direction. Uh, so that is one thing, a Czech reading of 68 as a culmination of a process, but I think this holds for the 60s in the West as well. Now, um, two main I mean, there are many debates about 68 in the Czechoslovak context, which I couldn't inflict on you at this late hour. But uh, I would mention two protagonists you are surely familiar with, uh, Václav Havel and Milan Kundera. They had an important exchange, two exchanges, during 68. And, uh, um, okay, I, I, I could try to summarize it crudely. This is unfair on them, but... Uh, they, they're not here and they will <laughs> forgive me. Uh, Kundera is saying, okay, despite the failures, despite etc., the Czechoslovak spring was a far-reaching experiment of significance uh, for the whole of Europe. 
this idea of combining democracy and socialism, this is unique, uh, unacceptable to Stalinist East, unacceptable to, uh, 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 to the capitalist West. This is unique. And it had been defeated, and it, so to speak, uh, because it was ahead of its time. So to, it was ahead of its time. And uh, even in our defeat, we are great, so to speak. Uh, we, we, are, we are holders of this important ID, just like the Protestant Reformation started in Bohemia a century before Luther. Well, then, you know, again, here we are. So, a, a, a bit of messianism never harms, and a bit of megalomania uh, uh, is, is, always, uh, is always important in, in crucial moments like, uh, uh, like uh, crises of, the, of this type. Václav Havel's take on this was much more sobering. He said, well, all this is very well. And you know, uh, Prague Spring, wonderful. And, uh, and he was himself very much engaged in that. But uh, basically, what we've got is recognition of human rights, freedom of expression, uh, democratic process, uh, more room for civil society. We, yeah, we got great things during the Prague Spring. And thanks for that. But you know, last time we had that was 30 years ago. So uh, uh, that was one thing. And secondly, well, most civilized countries in Western Europe actually do have the kind of things that uh, were beginning to fall into place. So we had these two views, one which had the, the, the big ID behind it, and the other one which said, you know, we are just correcting <laughs> 20 years of absurd uh, regime there. And, 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 and so you have there uh, the uh, uh, the two visions. And Havel adds at the end, you know, uh, of course, you may say that we are inspiring others. Great. But in the meantime, we dug ourselves in a hole. I mean, or we've been put in a hole. And, you know, we are entering this tunnel and we don't know when we're going to see the light at the end of the tunnel, uh, if ever. Nobody thought 1988 or 89 would would happen. So, so this is where I come to uh, the difference between uh, 1968 uh, East and West. Uh, 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 my own bias is Paris and Prague, but uh, to uh, stick to Kundera, um, uh, he uh, wrote a long essay, an interesting, very interesting, very thoughtful essay, w from which I can quote briefly. Uh, and he says, well, actually, this was, uh, um, yeah, Paris, May 68 was an explosion of revolutionary lyricism. Prague Spring was an explosion of post-revolutionary skepticism. This is why the Parisian students regarded Prague with some mistrust or other indifference, why the Prague students smiled at the Parisian illusions, etc. Et um, May 68 uh, was a radical uprising, whereas what we had uh, for uh, many has been leading towards the explosion of the Prague Spring was a popular revolt of the moderates. I like the term, the popular revolt by moderates. Uh, radicalism was something we were allergic to, etc. You understand uh, the point he's, ma he's making. And just, just to add another uh, uh, of his quote, uh, Paris May 68 challenged the basis of what is called European culture and traditional values. Prague Spring was a passionate defense of the European cultural tradition in the widest and most tolerant sense of the term, etc., etc. Um, so this is it. You have there, I think, and I, it, what does fit my own recollection uh, is really that you had there a tension. You, 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 have, you have first a strong similarity. I mean, generational, the way people dressed, the way they looked, the music they listened to. I mean, you can make all sorts of parallels about the transversal, the similar, yeah. And uh, Havel, uh, was, uh, Havel during 68 for the first time was allowed to travel and he went to, to the States, he went to California, he saw, you know, the, 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 the demos, the, the anti-war demos, the, the flower power, and he, 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 he he, 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 he rather liked what, what he saw. Um, but um, uh, uh, if I had to identify at least mention three 
differences, three, three different. One is the one Kundera just mentioned. We were trying to reconnect with Europe after having been a sort of uh, uh, Sovietized. Uh, so this was culturally, we were returning to Europe at the very moment when the 68 radicals in the West were looking to the third world. They were disappointed by the proletariat in the West, which was no longer revolutionary. That's, that's really a shame. So they turned to third world and, uh, you know, uh, Che Guevara, Ho Chi Minh, Mao, etc. became, so Ho Che, Mao, you have the, the pantheon of the 68ers. Uh, the second difference concerns the idea of, uh, you know, bourgeois democracies and, 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 and elections. Uh, in Paris 68, but this applied to others as well, the term bourgeois democracy was considered rather derogatory and elections was simply a trap, manipulation, etc. Well, if you looked at it from the point of view of Prague 68, after 20 years of communism, you think, you know, bourgeois freedoms are not to be scorned so lightly. And as far as the critique of consumer society and, and, and capitalism, well, again, this was a main West European and even, you know, transatlantic uh, dimension of 68. But in, in Prague or, or elsewhere in Central Europe, you know, after 20 years of socialist scarcity, um, uh, consumer society was not necessarily seen as such a terrible menace. Uh, anyway, so uh, um, uh, there is finally one more. And, and, and I could go on about the, about the Paris Prague thing forever, but there's one more 68 that is worth mentioning for understanding the following, and that is uh, Gorbachev's 68. Um, Mikhail Gorbachev had two important connections to 68. One was Denek Mlinar, his uh, 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 roommate from the university in Moscow in the early 50s. And they became very close friends, and therefore, all the ideas of the 60s in Prague, he got. And when Mlinar became the youngest member of the Politburo uh, in 1968, and he was in charge already before at the Academy of Science of designing the political reform of the Prague Spring, which never got to be implemented. And incidentally, he then, after signing Charter 77, he came into exile in Vienna, and I used to, in the 1980s, I used to uh, meet him here in this town for dinners, discussing the horrors of totalitarianism, and none of us had a clue that this was coming uh, uh, to, to, uh, to an end. So that was one thing. He got the ideas, Gorbachev had the ideas from, from, from Linar. And secondly, Yiri Dinsbir recalls that the first meeting with Gorb Yiri Dinsbir, former dissident who became foreign minister in December 1989, first meeting with Gorbachev and he says something about you know what happened in 68 and uh, what a tragedy it was for Czechoslovakia yeah he said it was a tragedy for Czechoslovakia but it was also a tragedy for us because it meant that uh, a possibility of change and reform was blocked in Moscow and this was the last chance we had to reform and we are now uh, uh, trying to catch up with this but basically if you read through the argument, you can have the point that the crashing of 68 was the beginning of the end or the uh, contribution to the demise of, uh, uh, of the communist system in the Soviet Union. Um, uh, of course, I know, I'm aware in this room that there is a strong competition about who contributed most to the demise of the Soviet system, you know, the, the Poles, of course, will say that it was Solidarność and, and the Hungarians that it was 1956 revolution. Uh, uh, but still, the, the Czech contribution, I think, in this Gorbachevian <laughs> perspective should not, be, should not be underestimated. So, uh, okay, 1989, and, and this, of course, Gorbachev leads us to 1989, because the fact that what he's saying is, we flunked it and we are trying to fix it, but basically the thing is unraveling. <laughs> and uh, uh, so, okay, 1989, the Velvet Revolution, was meant for 1988. Uh, and because of Gorbachev's procrastinations, 
uh, uh, as always, <laughs> on anything. It, there was a slight delay in the providential master plan of historical cycles that I have already mm -hmm. mentioned. So, um, yes, you have the, the demise of the old regime, the end of the Cold War. This is a European event par excellence, and you can connect, you know, string the, the, the Tim Garten Ashes sentence, Poland 10 years, Hungary 10 months, uh, East Germany 10 weeks, Czechoslovakia 10 days, you know. And then you could add uh, Romania 10 hours and <laughs> Albania 10 minutes. <laughs> so you, 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 you get this formidable acceleration, acceleration of history uh, in a time and the end of the Cold War. So yes, each of those countries and experiencing this as part of the new European predicament. And of course, for the Czechs, Havel stepping into Masaryk's shoes as the philosopher king, the outsider who makes it uh, to, uh, to the castle, uh, the moralist in politics. You can, you can, you can find all the parallels. Uh, that was perfect if you want to stress the idea of continuities. You know, 1918 to 1988, 89, you have the perfect continuity, uh, continuity there. And indeed, in both cases, you have democracy, sovereignty, and reconnection with uh, Western Europe, liberal democratic Europe. Fine. But then, th so that is the, the narrative, the 1989 sort of heroic narrative that makes it all connect. Uh, well, few reservations. First, 1989 is obviously an anti-1948. Uh, communist regime brought about. So that's an obvious one. It is also an anti-38, because this time Western democracies are there to support rather than, rather than let you down. But in a way, 1989 is also an anti-68, because it is not easy, easy to claim affiliation with an experiment that failed, that was crushed. Not easy to identify with a defeat, uh, one thing. And secondly, 68 was about a reform project still within socialism. 1989 is, uh, 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 no lo is elsewhere. Life is elsewhere, <laughs> uh, uh, to use Kundera's phrase. So yeah, you move on to uh, this is no longer socialist democracy. This is democracy. And this is no longer uh, uh, market combined with socialism. No, this is market, etc. So the liberal, uh, the liberal reading prevails. And uh, uh, so there was the only eight that 1988-89 could identify with. And that was 1918, as I said, the connection uh, of Masaryk, democracy and national sovereignty restore. And this is precisely where there is a snag. Because as soon as continuity was reestablished, democracy, freedom, etc., etc., uh, you have democracy and national sovereignty started to play havoc with Czechoslovak statehood. And the Czechoslovak divorce, although peaceful, civilized, um, not like in former Yugoslavia, showed that the continuity claim was impossible to sustain. Uh, I remember how Havel was so pleased that he managed to impose, so at least he, he was saying, in the Czechos Czech constitution for the newborn Czech state in January 93, um, uh, the idea, I mean, everybody wanted to claim the continuity. Yeah, that, that was. Uh, that was an obvious one. But no, he, he imposed the formula, we citizens living in Bohemia, Moravia, and Silesia, citizens. So he finally said, you know, like Masaryk, you know, the civic concept against, and he said it was not easy to, to have that. But of course, you look at the very same time, that project had been defeated. <laughs> the, very, the very separation of Czechoslovakia proved that uh, uh, Czech political elites were unable to uh, create a polity 
that would transcend their ethnic group. And uh, 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 that, uh, and, and of course they were not uh, uh, the only one or the first one to blame, obviously. The, 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 the Slovak endeavor uh, uh, was crucial. I was recently at a celebration of uh, uh, 1918, organized jointly, because the relationship are so close and so cordial, uh, by the Czechs and the Slovaks in, in, in Paris. And uh, the two ambassadors, and there was, a, uh, there was the Slovak Minister of European Affairs. And he said, yes, we are celebrating the creation of Czechoslovakia in 1918, etc. And we are also celebrating the 25th anniversary of uh, uh, independence. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> well, <laughs> great, you know. So, uh, 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 yes, so this is, uh, this is I think, um, the important thing, the end of Czechoslovakia occurs in parallel with the end of Yugoslavia, with the end of Yugoslavia. Both had been created at the same time with the new map of Europe, 1918, the new Europe Masaryk was talking about. Uh, uh, both had been federalized under communism and both disintegrated at the same time, at the very same time, parallel. Uh, violently, tragically in the case of Yugoslavia and, and, and peacefully uh, uh, in, the, in the Czechoslovak case. But both in Yugoslavia and Czechoslovakia highlighted this dilemma post-Cold uh, uh, War between uh, fragmentation and integration, which we are still confronted with in Europe. Look at Catalonia, look at uh, Belgium, look at Scotland, etc. This is not an exclusively East European uh, uh, problem. But the crucial thing for us is that therefore under the facade of continuity, we are restoring continuity. No. 1989 was not just the end of Yalta, of the partition of Europe. It was also the end of Versailles, of the map created uh, under uh, French, British and, and American sponsorship in, 19, uh, in 1918. Uh, Borges, the uh, Argentine writer, uh, has a short story where he talks about a bird with eyes behind his head. And he says, a bird flying backwards because not interested in where he's flying to, but where he's flying from. Well, uh, it is a fitting metaphor, I think, for Central Europe, Central Europeans trying to come to terms with their past. The eights, the Czechoslovak double loop, to use the Möbius strip uh, metaphor again, are an occasion or a pretext for revisiting these critical junctures uh, of European history. Uh, and uh, it is, of course, these anniversaries, it is very interesting in following the readings and the changes of the readings at each decade, you know, each 10 years you have such exercises. And uh, uh, so uh, the question is always, where did our tragedy start? It's, it's, it's uh, you know, the, to, to use Kundera's phrase, the tragedy of Central Europe, you know, being culturally West, politically East, geographically in the center. So what is, that is the, tragedy which was overcome in 1918 in, in 1918 and, and in 1989 because there you had the possibility of reconciling culture politics and and and, and geography but still in, in looking at these aids you're looking for uh, uh, an understanding of your um, of your present uh, crisis our present crisis that was the title of Masaryk's book in 1894 our present crisis. That was the title of a major article by, by Karel Kosik, the philosopher in 1968, was entitled Russian in our present crisis. So this is it. In the eighth, you're looking for the keys to understanding our present crisis. So which, which one? Where do we start? So is it 68? And in that case, yeah, this is the Russians fought. This is, uh, they, they crushed the aspirations, the hopes, etc., etc., hopes that mattered not just to Czechs and Slovak, but to, that had some significance to the whole of Europe, uh, uh, even if you don't buy fully Kundera's uh, 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 version slightly over the top. Or is it 48? Uh, then it is the Czechoslovak communist. They did, and then, of course, you have uh, Czechoslovak communists and the slide and so. Is it 38? 
the crucial date. Uh, Hitler and Western democracies not being up to it. Or do you go back to 1918? Was it, was it, uh, was it a dubious proposition in the first place? Uh, or a very risky one, let's put it that way, to create small vulnerable nation state between Russia and Germany. Uh, so you can, you can see that depending on the eight you choose, you have a different culprit. You have a different political target because these eights, these readings of the eights, of course, have a political uh, dimension, a political connotation. The West, Hitler, the communists, Russians, etc. You, you choose. Uh, uh, you choose your favorite uh, 68. Uh, uh, and uh, that's how I would conclude. Tell me what is your favorite eight, and I tell you who you are. <laughs> yes, take, take a seat, <laughs> Jacques. Uh, well, thank you so much, and I think I share the uh, sentiment of the audience that you gave us an extremely dense uh, view of, of the AIDS, uh, very much food for thought that we will not be able to digest uh, during the Q&A question and answer session. But let me use the, the privilege of the chair to ask you the first question before I open it to our uh, audience here. Um, and of course, so many things come to mind, but um, on Versailles, what one of the other interpretations as, as the world started falling apart in our part of the world, and was, one must add, of course, the, the falling apart of the Soviet Union as the third communist federation along with Czechoslovakia and Yugoslavia, is that uh, some people said that it's in fact the unfinished business of Versailles that was happening uh, in, in this disintegration. But, you know, uh, let, let's leave those the fancy definitions aside. One, one thing that came to mind when you talked about the third way was, of course, uh, the third way during the 68, Radoman Richter and the whole work of the economics uh, crowd in Prague. But my, my simple question to you is, bringing it to today, what, what is it that made the Czech Republic, in this case, produce two Václavs that are completely of different worldviews. What, what is it from your listening and reading and understanding of Czech history? And I use that as, as a simplifier to try and ask you, what, what is it that in the Czech Republic the Communist Party still has a sizable vote? Yes, clearly populism, various versions of it uh, are there as in other countries, but there seems to be something specific that's different in the Czech Republic because epitomized by the two Václavs. Well, um, I agree on the, on the on the first point. Yeah, you you, you could argue that, uh, of course, the Versailles system, because uh, Versailles is simply here used as a shortcut for discussing the new uh, European order. It was born out of exceptional circumstances, and and with the end of Austria-Hungary, you don't have the pivotal uh, country. Incidentally. Havel, in his very first speech, when he went to the Polish Sejm in, in January 1990, he says he talks about the need for cooperation in Central Europe. And uh, uh, of course, we should build on our common struggles against, uh, for democracy, etc., etc. But he also says we must create a cooperative Central European uh, uh, environment uh, to fill the void left by the demise of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So he there understood <coughs> that it was not just undoing uh, uh, Yalta, yeah, that was one thing, but you have to create something in Central Europe and, uh, and uh, in other words, yeah, the unfinished business of Versailles, he, perhaps not explicitly, he had it in mind. The, uh, and, and of course, we could discuss to what extent uh, the, uh, well, Gorbachev. I mean, Gorbachev was inspired by 68, but he had no understanding of what, uh, uh, what uh, um, the political order 
uh, of uh, Eastern Europe could be. Uh, he talked about a new common European house. Okay, that was his version. Uh, and uh, as far as I understand it, it was let's keep the things as they are, Soviet Union and Eastern Europe. However, you get you give them autonomy in their domestic affairs and uh, let the West engage in their economic recovery and so on, so long as they do not threaten the security of the Soviet Union, something like that. Well, okay, this is, this is now ancient history. Uh, uh, and uh, the failure of Gorbachev to articulate a vision of what he meant for uh, uh, the post-Soviet environment accounts a lot for what happened after, including for the new imperial uh, version that we're now getting uh, under Putin. Uh, very interesting, uh, yes, I, I didn't get into the third, you know, I mentioned Benesh in the third way, and there were, as I said, a lot of people during the war were in favor of that, you know, but everywhere. Uh, in, in Britain, I mean, uh, you know, the people forget, you know, the, the, the welfare state was created, uh, Beveridge, you know, uh, was a liberal, etc. This was, I mean, if you look at the pendulum, how, how it swung up at the end of the war, to the left, everywhere. I mean, Churchill, the hero of the war, he said, thank you very much, that was nice, and, and, and moved on and voted Labour. That was incredible. Uh, uh, in Italy, the Communist Party, everywhere, throughout Europe, you have, the move to the, you have this move to the left. And, the, and for many, uh, this third way was, uh, uh, was, an, appealing, uh, was an appealing proposition. Uh, 68, you, 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 you come back to the idea in a different context. And you mentioned Richter, I would add uh, Otashik. Otashik actually published a book called The Third Way. Uh, uh, and his idea was, yeah, third way between capitalism and socialism, that you would introduce market mechanism under socialism, and this was one way out of the crisis. And you would still re retain the a public sphere, a public sector that would be strong enough to... to so that, that was, I mean, from today's perspective, when there are so much debates about, you know, what are the flaws of neoliberalism and what are, et cetera, et cetera. This, this is not perhaps a totally irrelevant debate. Uh, Radovan Richter was something different because there you moved into, you know, the so-called scientific and technical revolution. And this well, was... Uh, when I mentioned Richter, I was actually wanting to say Otashik, but uh, oh, okay. Richter's name yeah. came out. He published a book, <laughs> Civilization at the Crossroad, and this was his big thing. For my taste, very technocratic, and this was... Yeah, uh, this is why it could survive after 68. Radovan Richter, you could, you could, I mean, Schick could not survive with his third way under normalization. That was taboo, that kind of idea. Radovan Richter, scientific technical revolution, why not, you know? Uh, so long as you don't mess up with politics. <laughs> that, 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 that. Now, uh, the two Václavs, well, um, first of all, just on, on the anecdotal part, Nobody knew the other Václav, uh, uh, Václav Klaus, before. I mean, everybody knew Václav Havel. And it was, you know, when the Civic Forum was created, they said, well, but, but you know, here are all these intellectuals, philosophers, uh, 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 you know, playwrights, etc. Does anybody know anything about economy? No, nobody knew, etc. And, and there was Rita, Klimo, Rita Klimova. I said, I, I, I know somebody, I know somebody who, etc. And she brought, eventually at the next meeting, she brought this guy, nobody knew, etc. And, uh, and he was sitting there. Little did they know, and, and, and I remember many people after, even Hammer said, you know, this was a terrible mistake, we brought him there. <laughs> anyway, anyway, so this is, this is how the two Hammer met, to the two Václavs uh, met, mm -hmm. and they really represented the two, uh, the two dimensions. One, as I said, the, the symbolic dimensions that I refer to, uh, the values that they brought from dissent, and that they somehow reconnected with the First Republic, the symbolic and the emphasis on democratic values. Uh, yeah, that was the important part. But let us, not, uh, let us remember also that Havel was a president who has very limited powers, that the people that were coming from dissent, they formed something called the civic movement, 
and there was uh, Dean Beer and Peter Hart and the whole group of them, they got 4.9% in the elections in June 92, and they were out of the picture, out of politics. So there you have it. Havel then uh, 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 finds himself completely isolated, and even after the Slovak MPs refused to vote for him, for his re-election as president in the summer of 92, he resigns. So there he is, in the cold, on his own, and many people think, in retrospect, I have doubts about that, but why not, that he could have then said, I have accomplished my mission as uh, uh, bringing, uh, helping to bring about democracy. I'm returning to my true mission, which is to be an independent intellectual, a dissident, uh, a free spirit, what have you. Anyway, he decided to be a dissident in the castle. That, that's, that was fine with me. But, uh, but of course, to get back to the castle, he had to make a, an arrangement with the other Václav. Because he, after the election of June, 92 was the real boss. The symbolic power, yeah. Uh, in French, I would say, l'arbre qui cache la forêt. He's there, the tree uh, that hides the forest. But the real thing was Klaus, his victory, his deal with Mechar to break up the state, and his, uh, uh, yeah, economic drive, we're going to be give it to me, we're going to privatize, we're going to do it fast, and we have to do it so fast, because we must not be any delay, that we're not going to look at any of the legal, which would delay us unnecessarily. And this was it. He was the father of this uh, 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 huge economic transformation, and people, because prosperity was there, people actually bought into it, and he was popular. So that is, that is one thing, you know, there was Havel, the values, etc. but deep down, the economic transformation, and that was him. And he sold economic transformation. And the relationship between the two, of course, was reversed. The, suddenly, it was Klaus who, Havel could not become president of the Czech Republic without, with, with, without Klaus, without his party. And, uh, uh, I remember the, 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 this, especially in the early period, 93, 94, when Klaus would come every week because Havel wanted to go to, the, uh, to government meetings. And uh, Klaus said, no, 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 I will come and report to you what happened in the, in, 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 in the government uh, meeting. And he would come every week and he would start by telling Havel off. He'd say, my God, you know, you gave this interview and you are saying this, but how can you possibly, etc. And Havel, who is a very decent, you know, etc. Uh, et and, you know, it took him a while before he would uh, uh, sort of respond. And this was a pattern. Until one day when he, of course, as a playwright, he understands le comique de répétition, you know, he, un <laughs> he, he understands. And so, until one day when, when, when Klaus arrived, before Klaus and me, he said, let, let me finish. You said something absolutely incredible, outrageous, etc. And that is, and the other guy was completely flabbergasted that uh, 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 suddenly have a, you know, this is this is a playwright at work, reverse the roles, and and and, but unfortunately only, only only at that moment uh, the, the the power politics in the country. But they do, I mean, just to cut a long uh, story short, they do represent the two poles, the. The, 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 the part of the country uh, uh, that, uh, for, for whom this uh, democratic ethos and the European ID were absolutely crucial, and the other part largely inherited from the normalization period, which was basically don't bother about values, politics, etc., just look after your interest. If you don't steal from the state, you are stealing from your family, was the motto of the day. So it is with that, it is that mentality that came into the transformation. So this, these were the tale of two sides of the transformation coin. And when, Havel, uh, when, Klaus, when Havel left and Klaus became his successor, this was not successor, this was a radical breach. And uh, you have followed since some of his adventures. The latest was he was a guest speaker, 
keynote speaker at the Alternative for Deutschland Congress. Um, and upon returning to Prague, he published an article in a Prague daily, Lidovanovine, entitled Only Kebabs, Total Depression. This was, his imp this was a former Czech president visiting Germany. <laughs> Only kebabs, total depression. So, you know, you have there Klaus, which takes the exact opposite of Havel. Havel says, what is Czech identity? A Czech identity is European ID. I'm a Czech. He, he would say, I'm from Prague. I'm a Czech. I'm a European. The three things fit into each other. There's no contradiction between them. Klaus's uh, uh, motto is, shall we let our sovereignty and our identity to be diluted uh, uh, in Europe like a lump of sugar in a cup of coffee? So you have that, the metaphor, you know. One who says Czech identity is part of European identity, and the other one says, no, the European thing is a threat to our sovereignty and our identity. And of course, debate about sovereignty is perfectly legitimate. But the semantic slip from sovereignty to identity, well, the whole of populist movements in Europe, we are in a truly European debate there. This is exactly what it's made of. Yeah, we saw a Hungarian minister visiting Vienna in the <laughs> past few days. Oh, okay. <laughs> but I won't elaborate. We have time for, uh, let's say, three, three questions or four if they're short. And uh, so please uh, yeah. make a show of hands and please do introduce yourselves before you ask the question. Um, my name is Martin Wolf. I have a question on, on your perception of, as to uh, Václav Havel and the Constitution of 93. What he did feel it was actually a citizen, That's because you mentioned we the citizens of Moravia and so on. Uh, did he recognize as a citizen only those who were citizens in that time, meaning an ethnically clean uh, Czechoslovakia or Czech, in the sense that it was cleaned after 38, it was cleaned after 46, and were only those Czechs? Or how did he define who was a Czech? Well, yeah. Jacques, let me collect two more questions and then we'll... Anyone else? Yeah. A short question. I will just uh, hook up to the final statement that you made. Uh, depending on which year you, you choose, you have a different culp culprit, uh, 38, 48, 68. But uh, maybe in addition, one could also say it also very much depends on the interpretation of the single event. You could have a different culprit as well. And to put it into a short question, provocative question, what about 38? Um, you said Hitler, obviously, he's the culprit. What about Czechoslovakia itself? What could, have, could Czechoslovakia have done? Should Czechoslovakia have gone for war? And the third question I'll take here, and then the final question will be over at the end. Uh, Paul Michalevich, uh, Vienna. Yes, uh, starting with 38, because before uh, Czech Republic, of course, there was Austria, uh, and it's March, so it's the very, the very uh, month, actually. And I don't know, but uh, probably because of time, we had to skip Austria. Uh, when we got skipping Austria, you mentioned uh, all Europe went uh, left. Uh, there were two overall majorities uh, of Christian Democratic parties in Austria and Hungary, and at all uh, parties also in the West uh, were of uh, were leftist. You talk about when? Forty-five. 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 Not Austria, not Hungary, and also parts of uh, Western Europe were not left. And final question at the back there. My name is Walter Kemp. My question is, why was there no referendum for the breakup of Czechoslovakia? And in the relevant supplementary, but if there had been, do you think the country would have stayed together? Okay, back, back to you. Okay, so uh, first, uh, Havel, uh, yeah, the, the formulation in the Constitution, may občané Czech, Moravia, Slezska, žijící, we citizens, 
it's a living in Czech, Czech Republic. So it applies to all citizens living in the Czech Republic. So of course, if you're asking the question, what about the uh, uh, citizens, uh, people that were citizens uh, in 1938 and uh, then resigned their citizenship, which was, of course, the case uh, 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 in the Reich, and, uh, uh, and were expelled. So Havel is not talking about that. He's talking about uh, the country at that particular moment. He's not doing a history. Actually, Havel, if, if this is the issue you are interested in, Havel is probably the, not only as an intellectual, but as president, who went further in making uh, courageous, profound uh, speeches, not just gestures, on these very sensitive issues of the expulsion of the uh, Sudeten Germans. Uh, this is, uh, uh, and of course, he was very much attacked by the other Václav uh, for that. So this is a sensitive issue. And Havel had the courage to do it, and he did it very early on. Um, and uh, I suppose he did it partly because this was you know, in the dissident debates, yes, these questions were raised. And there were articles written about it, essays, and this was debated. You know, when I said, when, when did our tragedy start? Well, you know, there's 38, et cetera. And somebody said, well, 45. And 45, that's what I said, the communists had already the key, leverage of, of, of key levers mm -hmm. of power. But it was also the expulsion of the Germans. So you could say uh, this was part of that tragic decade of the slide into, so these were familiar debates for dissident and, and Havel becomes president and goes to Germany and he makes a speech which uh, takes by surprise his fellow citizens. They say, what is he talking about? What? And uh, uh, there's nothing to apologize for, etc. And you discover that the huge discrepancy between the milieu the small intellectual dissident milieu he was coming from, and the rest of the country. This is, and you know, this is something, a divide that goes on until today. Look at the latest presidential election, you find these differences on similar issues. What is a nation? How to define it? Who belongs, who doesn't, etc. And of course, this then translates into all sorts of attitudes, policies towards migrants in particular, but not only. So this is, uh, no, I, I, I find Havel's statement perfectly normal, and I don't see why he should have addressed the question of former pre-World War II citizens. But that, that, that wouldn't make sense after, uh, 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 after 1993. Uh, uh, 1938, uh, oh yes, the culprits from within. Yeah, you're, 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 you're. yes, this is a, this is of course. A, well, I said thirty-eight. It's interplay between internal vulnerabilities and external uh, 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 pressure. The latter prevailing. Of course, the internal vulnerabilities. You could either say, oh, they were there from the beginning, and therefore because it was because it has failed in Munich. And you could add, and because it had failed again in 92, then it was a doomed project from the beginning. You could, you could even have that argument. And you know, this is what Bergson called the illusion of retrospective, retrospective determinism. You know, you, you come to a point point and you work yourself back and you say, okay, it failed and therefore it was inevitable, uh, uh, the failure was inevitable from its, from its creation. I don't buy that argument at all, because in the 1920s, you had a situation where not only the Czechs and Slovaks were working together, with, of course, one main problem, the Slovaks had the understanding that the Pittsburgh Declaration, which would grant autonomy to Slovakia, would be implemented within the 10 years after, uh, after 1918. That was not the case. But you had Slovaks within the government, German parties were in the government, part of the coalition. Uh, and you had, therefore, this was, this was a you, it's always difficult to make history with ifs. If the 
economic crisis of 1930s didn't come, if Hitler hadn't come in Germany, etc. You might have imagined that this model of gradually integrating into the political system the uh, uh, parties and finding if, if the Czechs had been wise enough to do devolution of power towards Slovakia, etc. I think the misunderstanding by Czechs of the Slovak question is absolutely, is absolutely crucial. Uh, and, 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 and it's not just them. It goes all the way to, uh, to the early uh, 1990s. I think that there, there was a yeah, uh, misunderstanding of, because the languages are so close, and because they were the junior partners, because Masaryk himself was half Slovak, etc., etc. So there was this feeling that, yeah, this is a, this is a little brother, and they, they will follow in due course or something like that, and that that didn't uh, uh, that eventually didn't happen, thanks to Czechoslovakia, Slovakia, Slovak nation became uh, uh, a very different one from the one it was at the beginning of the century. So uh, yeah. Uh, you could therefore, I, I would agree, there were internal culprits. Um, and you know, this is a debate among historians. You have people like Mary Hyman, who has published a book called The State That Failed. And this is precisely the history you work yourself by. What is the main culprit? Czech nationalism, i.e. Masaryk himself. Why did they create the state? And they, they created a state where um, Czechs were yeah, the most numerous, the dominant element. And that in itself was a form of oppression and it, it was not true uh, uh, multiculturalism or whatever you want to call it. Though this would be the wrong term. There were more schools in the German language in, Czechoslo in Bohemia in the 1930s uh, uh, than in the Reich. More school, German school per habitants. You know, so uh, uh, so this is uh, this is. Uh, if you interested in that, you read uh, Wolfgang Brügel, you know, a German historian, a social democrat, who stayed in London during the war and never returned. Uh, he knew what was coming, and he wrote a book about Munich, and he well he wrote the monumental Czechen und Deutsche, and uh, that that's uh, that's the uh, uh, that's the. Uh, uh, for those who want a different. So Mary Hyman, if you want to say it was doomed from the beginning and the idea of failed state is, is, uh, is nowadays, you know, the phrase is catchy. Or you read uh, Bruegel and you see what is wrong, what are the weaknesses, but also the missed opportunities. And uh, uh, yeah, so there were the internal culprits and certainly the Czech misunderstanding of the Slovak question and um, the incapacity to um, make those coalitions from the late 20s sustain in the 1930s. Uh, um, yeah, certainly you can. If you read Patochka, he's quite, um, quite critical of the way um, the idea of what I said, the move from the cultural ethnic definition, linguistic definition of the nation to the civic, that it was not fully carried through. Because of what I said about the Czechoslovak nation as the key legitimating principle, you then created de facto in the perception two categories of citizens. And yeah, he, uh, so he's, he's quite critical of that. Doesn't mean that he says they, this is the, what needed to bring the country uh, 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 apart, but, but he would be critical. For him, the philosopher uh, that went further in, un in trying to understand that was Emmanuel Radl. And, and uh, yes, there is a whole stream of thought who critically examines uh, the, the, the First Republic. Yeah, the, the, when I said the First Republic became the kind of pantheon, the reference point, yeah, there are vulnerable points. Um, my argument would still be this would not have happen if there hadn't been a change in Germany after 1933. The Sudeten Deutsche Partei becomes a completely different proposition after, after 1933. If there is a debate actually that I didn't mention about Munich, culprits, and when in the Czech case you ask culprits, they wouldn't be talking about what I just said. They would be talking about capitulation. Should we have fought or uh, 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 was Benesch's 
uh, was banishes uh, 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 giving in uh, against all the odds? Was it? Uh, uh, was it? And of course, you know, this is you, you have parts, entire libraries could be filled with debates of that. Kapitulovat, Chiboyovat, these were titles of articles. And uh, yeah, why, why it became so important? Because it was not just 38. Benesh capitulated again, so to speak, in 48, when he signed in the new government after the takeover. And then you have Dubček in 68, who goes to Moscow and signs the Moscow Protocol. So this syndrome of uh, uh, capitulation uh, that would be one kind of criticism and one kind of culprits. Of course, when you ask, you know, Benesh provided all sorts of arguments why he did what he did, and uh, uh, in 48 he had no means to oppose what was happening, and in 68, I remember when Alexander Dubček came to Sciences Po uh, in the early 90s, there was a huge, you know, crowd of students, etc., who hardly knew, I mean, he, they were not around when Dubček uh, 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 was uh, uh, in charge. And one of the students asked him, well, why, why, did, you, uh, why did you capitulate, etc., isn't it? And uh, uh, Dubček gave uh, a rather moving, very personal, and almost convincing. <laughs> uh, uh, I say almost because at the end I, I, I had to, uh, but uh, argument of why, you know, he said, here was, I was there, and should I have given the order to fight, knowing this is going to lead to bloodshed, thousands and thousands of people going to die, and the defeat is guaranteed, because there is, half, you know, half a million troops moved in, and you just, so, how do you take on your conscience the idea that, that uh, of course, my, uh, uh, my take would be, I, I understand the point, and this is a dilemma of statements, but sometimes uh, uh, fighting and losing might be in the long run a different kind of, you know, uh, that would be the Polish argument if you want, uh, 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 might be preferable for the long term uh, moral vertebra of, of the country. So this is the, yeah, this is the dilemma uh, which, uh, <laughs> no, and there was a final, there was one. Referendum. Oh yeah, referendum. Well, uh, yeah, the, the partition of the country was the, in fact f illegal because there should have been a referendum. And there were calls for referendum, Havel asked for a for referendum, then there were petitions for referendum, etc. Sorry? It was legislatively uh, said that uh, the <coughs> splitting the country has to be done through a referendum. Yeah. So you could argue that the partition from this point of view was illegal. I would not push the argument too far because it is true that nobody called openly for separation in Slovakia. I mean, except a very small uh, nationalist party. But Mechiar. Uh, was proposing, uh, run a campaign on a platform which was, we need a president for Slovakia, we need a sovereign declaration of sovereignty for Slovakia, we need Slovakia as a subject of international law with its own diplomatic. So, you, you, you listen, so the word independence or separation is not mentioned, but it is all there. And so he wins the election on that. Well, uh, um, what happens then? Klaus, the Czech, the victor on the Czech side, turns to him and say, do you really want to implement this program? I.e., you would not be the first in history who doesn't entirely fulfill <laughs> the <laughs> electoral promises. And Mecha says, no, 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 I want to, I want to fulfill. You really want to fulfill? Well, yes. Well, in that case, we have to uh, uh, get down to the nitty gritty and you know the forks are yours, the knives are mine, and, and you, you you divide the cutlery, and 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 uh, and within six months it's done, without uh, without a referendum, but with two strong players who had a very strong mandate. One was for federal for confederation uh, uh, from below, and the other one was from 
federation from above, uh, Klaus, and the two pro proved to be uh, irreconcilable. At the very end, Mechar proposed a, a Maastricht, uh, a Czechoslovak Maastricht, which is that uh, uh, there would be a shared currency and shared defense, <laughs> and uh, because Maastricht had a common security. And uh, uh, Klaus said, well, y you want separate economic policy, but the same <laughs> uh, <laughs> monetary policy. <laughs> and you want uh, your own foreign minister, and you want a common defense. Well, this is, you know, a Czech insurance policy for Slovak responsibility, and we can't have it. So th th this was the, uh, uh, by then, this was a done deal. But it is true that uh, for many people, it remains that it was done without a referendum, that is, without the constitutional request. So this was illegal. I asked Havel a number of times about, uh, you know, what, what he thought. Were, and, of course, he, you know, being a, pre being a pres head of state, being a president of a state that dissolves can hardly be considered a success. Okay, so this is, this is a major, this is his main failing. Uh, but he would say, okay, the, I stepped down because I wanted to be no part in the Havel, uh, in, in the Klaus Mechar uh, um, breaking up of the state. Well, you know, uh, normally the, the captain leaves the boat at the, at, at the very end. And I'm saying this because, because uh, simply uh, that's, uh, these were discussions uh, 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 we had. But he also said something that in retrospect, he said, I was against the separation. I wanted to go, et etc. et cetera. However, I don't know what the situation would have been if we hadn't done it. Because there was a danger that in the following period, all politics, all economic debates, all cultural issues, all foreign policy matters would have been somehow translated into this Czechoslovak fight. And he said it would have poisoned, there was a risk that it would poison the new democracy, the, the new the political system. Okay, you can say this is making a, a virtue out of necessity, but uh, it's a, it's a reading that cannot be totally excluded. And given the fact, this is my last word on this, given the fact that they separated peacefully and both of them still consider themselves to be the closest in all the surveys, you ask about Czechs, who, who, who are the nation, who, who is, which is the nation you feel closest to? Slovaks, always number one, and vice versa. Incidentally, the French are the number two for the Czechs. Okay. For 25 years. Uh, so uh, th that shoots me. Uh, <laughs> well, Jacques, thank you so much. This was a riveting evening. Please join me in thanking Jacques.